Hello folks, my name is Josh Taylor and I'd like to welcome you to the 12th annual Telling Tales Festival and our first ever virtual gathering. Whether you are a veteran fan who has been to the festival or whether this is your very first time joining us, we are so happy to see how stories connect us, no matter how far apart we live. Speaking of where we live, the Telling Tales Festival happens in a place where people have lived and told stories for thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Neutral Peoples. Today, it is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and to many other indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We recognize our responsibility to learn about their rich history so that we can better understand our roles as caretakers, neighbors, and friends. With a good heart and mind, we honor the sacred indigenous tradition of storytelling by presenting our program today. Miigwech, Nyawe, and thank you. Oh, we're on, we're on. We're on. Everyone, welcome to Do the Right Thing, that is W-R-I-T-E, Do the Right Thing, where we are going to hear from an expert about the process of becoming a writer with ideas from a few others about how easy it is for you to begin. Check out this entire show to learn from the Hamilton Youth Poets about the building blocks of creating your own story through spoken word, rap, or slam poetry. Whatever you call it, it's your story. Set it to music, soundscapes, samples, and then record it on video or audio file, and just, or you could just write it down. If you do the right thing, this is with an R, by uploading your work on the Telling Tales contest page, then you will be eligible to win a Slam Poetry swag bag that includes a copy of our featured artist's latest novel, and it is stuffed with other surprises too numerous to mention. The deadline is November 30th, so do not delay. Up next, please join me in welcoming Tanaz Bethina. Tanaz joins us to talk about her latest, Hunted by the Sky, a fantasy adventure set in medieval India. She'll be joining us live in the chat stream, so definitely post your questions, and she will try to answer as many as she can. Tanaz Bethina is the author of The Beauty of the Moment, as well as the critically acclaimed A Girl Like That, which received two starred reviews and was named a best book of the year by Seventeen, The Globe and Mail, and The Times of India, among others. A resident of Mississauga, Tanaz's books are enjoyed worldwide. Simply put, Tanaz is a literary superstar. We are thrilled to welcome her to Telling Tales. Hi, my name is Tanaz Bhatena and I'm the author of Hunted by the Sky. I'm really excited to be a part of the Telling Tales Festival today and I'm going to be reading a short excerpt from my book followed by an interview with some students who have read it. So without further ado, let me begin. This book is about a girl who is seeking vengeance against a tyrant king for ordering the murder of her parents. And this excerpt begins shortly after her parents have died and she's hiding in a stable of a wealthy landowner. The wealthiest landowner in Bukal has gray hair, a greasy smile, and teeth that shine yellow in the light of the farnas he holds over his head flames dancing in the lantern's clear glass confines. I peer at Zamindar Mulchan through the window next to the Jwalian mare's stall, watching him talk to three traveling women who have asked to spend the night. Anand Pranam, the happiest of salutations. Even with his palms respectfully joined, Zamindar Mulchan makes the ancient greeting sound perverted. Be my guests for the night, ladies. Sate your hunger with my bread. My home is your home. So Abhar Zamindar, says the tallest of the women. A hundred thank yous. Another woman might have added the common tongue honorific, G, perhaps even delivered the greeting flirtatiously. This woman doesn't, even though she smiles, her deep brown skin glowing in the moonlight. 
The pallu of her simple homespun sari slides down her head, revealing streaks of blue in her midnight hair. Ma once told me that it's the sort of blue that can't be covered up with soot or the oil from a Jatamansi plant or magic the mark of someone from the seafaring kingdom of Samudra. The sight of it makes Zamindar Mulchan's unctuous smile slip. My father married a woman from Samudra before the Great War, the woman says now. She died when I was a baby. She speaks our language perfectly, her vani smooth, the accent crisp and airy. It holds no trace of the sea. We are headed back from Sur where one of my daughters had a baby. The Zamindar would do us poor women a big favor by offering us a place in his stable for the night. The Zamindar turns his attention to the other sari-clad figures. One has shielded herself from his gaze, tucking her pallu like a whale over her mouth and nose. The other, a pretty, pale-skinned young woman, looks unperturbed by his leer. Why don't I offer you and your friends more comfort, he says. I have five guest bedrooms. It can get lonely in this big old house. We prefer the stable. A hint of steel cuts through the quiet deference in the older woman's voice. Our horses are tired. We need to ensure they are well rested. She stares at the zamindar until he averts his head and nods. I duck behind a bale of hay in Agni's stall as Mulchan opens the door to the stable, letting in the women. What a lech, a voice says. It's the whale woman, no, a girl, who finally uncovers her face, revealing dark, surma-lined eyes and skin like fine copper. Like her companions, the girl's hair is bound in a braided bun. Unlike the other two, she wears a square amulet tied around her upper arm, marking her as a follower of the Prophet Zal. She appears to be a few years older than me. I thought I'd have to strip him naked and hang him upside down from the roof of a stupid haveli. The pale girl snorts, <laughs> like what you did to that safflower merchant last year for calling you his little flower bouquet? Seriously, Amira. Don't give me that look, Kali. You were a few seconds away from slicing him up like an onion with your daggers. A pause before they both burst into giggles. Enough, you two. The older woman cuts in. I don't want to have to modify the memories of an entire household again. Sky warriors were at this village a few days ago. I still see traces of their magic against the trees outside. As the girls murmur apologies, I think of the stories I heard growing up, of women with shadowy faces and daggers glinting in their hands, women who wear their saris like fisherfolk, who knock down doors and slash into enemies with knives and swords and spells. The Sisterhood of the Golden Lotus. And that is it for the excerpt. Now over to the students. Oh. I really like the main character, Gull, and I was wondering, like, if I ever wrote a book, I would portray the main character to have characteristics like me. Did you do the same? Gull is not like me at all. <laughs> so <laughs> I am completely different. Uh, she is, um, uh, I think, also because of the way her life has um, uh, developed, like, her parents died at a very early age, and, you know, it left her with this trauma, and just to survive, she needed some sort of mission, so she comes up with this idea of vengeance, that she's going to kill the king, and she's going to kill the major who killed her parents, and, you know, it, it's kind of like, she's Arya Starking here, but <laughs> she's basically, <laughs> like, you know, really into uh, uh, this idea that she's going to find uh, these people who killed her parents and she's going to get them justice. And so uh, she makes certain decisions that I certainly might not have made. But if I had been in her position, I don't know. Would I have done the same thing? Perhaps, because our lives are com is completely different. So if she had had my life, maybe she would have done what I do, you know. So I think it really depends on how our characters of the situations we place our characters in, that's what affects them. And that's what, you know, changes the course of their stories uh, through the novel. And I think that's true of life too. I, my question was, one of my questions were, what were your inspirations for the gods and goddesses in your stories? And so I can tell like, there's like a lot of cool pantheons in obviously in your culture. But I was wondering what type of research did you do to have your ideas? Like your sky goddess and your not Poseidon water god and also those little moon goddesses. What did you have to do to get inspiration for those guys and all the others? 
So I definitely are like uh, used a lot of mythology, especially Hindu mythology, uh, when I was developing these gods and goddesses. And um, I did not want to, the book to be a retelling of uh, mythology because I felt that a lot of uh, retellings have been done of Hindu mythology and they've been done really well by better authors. So I just wanted to play around a little bit. And so what I did was that I used um, many references. So the sky goddess was partially inspired by, you know, Saraswati and Durga, and, you know, taking ideas from those two goddesses. And then the moon goddesses were completely my own invention. I was just playing around with the idea of you know having this society which was very open to love and different kinds of love um, which is uh, something that I had to really come up with because uh, India was colonized by the British and oftentimes our history is told through that lens of colonization so there are lots of uh, problematic elements over there as well like homophobia and things like that so I was you know doing some research and I came across medieval love poetry where men were expressing their love for other men and then I said to myself okay so it makes perfect sense for this kingdom which is not colonized by foreign rule to have uh, an annual festival that celebrates the love of two gay goddesses so that is something that I um, came up with on my own so that myth uh, and I truly love it uh, in terms of the other characters uh, there are a few others which I'm not going to talk about much because I know they'll spoil the book uh, for people who haven't read it but uh, those were inspired by Persian mythology so I am also ethnically Persian because my ancestors came from Persia to India many years ago and I'm part of the Parsi or Zoroastrian community and so I really read the Shanama to come up with those ideas and bring them in and just Basically, I was also mixing mythologies at that point and coming up with the creatures and doing all sorts of stuff. Have you ever made a zine? Let's get DIY with Tara Bursi from the Art Gallery of Burlington, who is going to show us the way to becoming a self-published writer by creating a zine. Hi everyone, my name is Tara Bursi. I'm the Associate Educator at the Art Gallery of Burlington. And today I'll be talking to you all about zines and showing you how to make one of your very own. You may be wondering, what is a zine? Zines take their name from magazines. They are small, self-produced books, often made in small print runs on a photocopier. The roots of zines can be traced back to a few examples of self-publishing from history, from Civil War era broadsides and beat poetry chapbooks to punk fanzines from the 1970s and 80s. For the last few decades, zines have served as a great way for young people to distribute their ideas in book form. The beauty of zines is that they're personal, cheap to make, and there are endless ways to create them. Zine makers create zines about countless topics. A big part of the beauty of zines is how diverse they are. Like books or movies, zines can often be broken down into a few genres. Her zines are a classic zine format. These zines have a journal-like quality and document the experiences of the author. They recount places the author goes, people they meet, and their memories. And as a reader, you really feel like you get to know the person who made them. Music scenes have a really long history. Most of the music scenes I own are about punk music and take the time to honor underground bands and musicians that people may not be able to get to know otherwise. These zines include interviews, articles and photos, and sometimes document the history of different musical styles. Comic and art zines are known for their visual qualities. Sometimes they contain collage art, comic art, drawings, and other visual experiments and involve different printing methods such as risograph printing, color photocopying, and screen printing. Today I'm going to be showing you how to make an eight-page mini zine of your own. Start by gathering a regular piece of paper, scissors and a glue stick, old magazines, and any writing utensils or art materials you can find around your home. Your first step is to fold your piece of paper into eight equal parts. Make sure your folds are precise. With a pair of scissors, cut a careful slit in the center of your paper like this. Grab the cut paper and refold it so it creates a cross. Collapse the folded paper so that it creates a small blank eight page booklet. 
Now your zine template is ready to work on. If you don't have any ideas for what your zine will be about, that's okay. Often I start with my cover design and browse magazines to see what ideas emerge. See where your instincts take you. Here I'm playing around with different tools I have on hand and relying mostly on collaging from my books and magazines. I've decided to name my zine Crooked Music. How can I explore the idea of what this title means with what I add to the zine on the following pages? The next step to creating your zine is to make copies of it. Find a photocopier. Place your zine template face down on the copier bed. Decide if you want to copy your zine in black and white, colored ink, or on colored paper. Don't be afraid to experiment. For this zine, I'm going to use colored ink. Make as many copies as you'd like to trade, sell, or give away to family and friends. And there you have it, a finished eight page mini zine. Try it yourself, seek out zines where you live or online, and support indie publishing. For more information on programs at the Art Gallery of Burlington, visit our website at www.artgalleryofburlington.com. Thanks, Tara. Be sure to definitely show us your zines. Upload your work to the Creativity Club on the Telling Tales website and poof, become a public writer, just like that. Um, what was your hardest scene to write or rewrite it? Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. I think, uh, okay, so I'm going to stick to the first book because there are lots of hard scenes in the second one as well. Uh, but the first uh, book, uh, the hardest scene really was the twist. So, um, which comes towards the middle of the book. And I'm not going to spoil too much about it, but I had no idea that it was going to go that way initially when I started writing. I did not have that planned. So, um, uh, when I actually, when it happened, I just realized that, oh, I'd already left a few seeds in the very beginning that this is a possibility and this could happen toward uh, the end of the book. And so that was one of the more challenging scenes because I didn't know what I was writing initially when I was just going in blind. And so uh, that was also, but when it happened, it was like the best feeling ever that, oh, wow, this just happened. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, what made you decide you want to write something of that fantastical nature? Because I know you've written like more teen romance novels, like A Girl Like Her and In the Beauty of the Moment. I was wondering what made you decide, hey, I want to write this story. That is a wonderful question. So I really loved reading fantasy as a child. Um, when I was 11 years old, I wrote my first ever short story and it was about, about a werewolf at a girl's boarding school. And so that was my thing. I really loved write, reading fantasy. But a lot of the fantasy that I read that was written by um, Western authors, and oftentimes when I tried to write these stories, you know, something wouldn't work. My pixies wouldn't look like pixies. My elves wouldn't look like elves. Something was always off. So I kind of put that aside and I started writing more contemporary or realistic fiction. Um, and so many years later, after I finished A Girl Like That uh, in 2016, I thought to myself, I'm really bored of contemporary. I don't want to write this anymore. I want to write something different. I was still too intimidated by fantasy because I thought I couldn't do it. So I thought I'd try something more, quote unquote, realistic. And then I ended up with the sci-fi dystopian novel, which is truly terrible. And um, then you know, I realized to myself, I really love the characters in this book, but the plot and the setting don't work. And so a friend of mine who read the book, she said, why don't you just use magic? 
And then I said, yeah, why don't I? What have I got to lose at this point? So I started rewriting the book with magic. And um, in terms of the real inspirations, I knew I wanted to write this fantasy where brown warrior women were, you know, wielding arms and, you know, doing magic and just being total badasses. And that's what I really wanted to do in this particular book. I was also really inspired by this group of women in India called the Gulabi Gang, and they're from North India. So not, right now they're a welfare organization, but they had vigilante origins. So these women would wear these pink or gulabi colored saris, and they'd go from village to village with sticks, and they like protect women who were being abused by their in-laws or their husbands and stuff like that. And it was really kind of cool. And so I thought, I'm, I'm going to write the Sisterhood of the Golden Lotus into this book. And so I just, you know, got inspired by that. In fact, Gul's name comes from Gulab or the Gulabi gang. So I kind of, you know, integrated both of those things in. I also just kind of was inspired by lots of uh, women in India, especially historical women in, during the medieval period. Um, there was this amazing empress called Nur Jahan. And she was married to Mughal Emperor Jahangir. And she was, I think, possibly the only Mughal queen who had her name and likeness minted on a coin, which was really rare during that time period. And so I really wanted to put in women who were fighting, women with political ambition, who were not ashamed to have that political ambition. So those were some of the key inspirations of creating this book. Um, I was wondering if there was a hidden meaning behind your title. Uh, absolutely. Um, so uh, not too hidden because, you know, the, uh, the kingdom of Umber is basically, Umber means sky in uh, Hindi or Sanskrit. And so basically the king of Umber represents the sky. And so he was hunting these girls. So hunted by the sky. And that's uh, what was uh, playing around over there. Uh, what inspired you to become a writer? Uh, when did you realize, was there like a specific moment when you were like, okay, I want to pursue writing or I want to write a book. I think the earliest possible moment was when I was eight years old and I was just like, you know, my school had this annual magazine where they had like kids uh, write poetry and stories and stuff like that. And I'm like, I just want to write a story for that, you know, and just, I just wanted to do it. And that was that one key moment where I remember, you know, wanting to do something like that. And then uh, I started, you know, playing around with, characters and just, you know, writing uh, stuff, imitating my favorite authors at the time. I used to read a lot of R.L. Stein and, you know, Goosebumps and Fear Street and stuff like that. Uh, so I used to imitate him. I used to read a lot of Sweet Wally, so I used to write a lot of stuff imitating that. Um, and by the time I was 13, I knew that I wanted to write stories, but I did not really pursue writing until I was in my 20s. Uh, after university professionally, because, you know, for the longest time I was doing what most South Asian kids do. I was following a, a career path that my parents had laid out for me. And they said that you're going to be a chartered accountant. So I said, okay, fine. That's what I'm going to be. But I secretly still wanted to be a writer and write books. So eventually at the end of my four years at university, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply for a correspondence course at for creative writing at Humber College. And I started working full-time and I also started writing part-time. So that's how it began and, you know, went into um, professional writing, I guess. If a movie were to be made of your book, um, who would you cast as a leading roles? Oh my God. This is such a tough question. Okay, I, I don't even know young people, uh, young actors right now who can be cast. I think there needs to be a casting call, which is like open to all these young actors who actually fit into these roles because, uh, you know, right now the industry itself, like Hollywood at least, you know, there, there's not a lot of diversity and I want to see the actors who actually fit into these roles to be cast into them. So I guess an open casting call is absolutely necessary. And I'm guessing that um, you all probably know which young actors are out there right now who are good and suitable for these kinds of roles. So I'm, I'm a little old right now. I feel my age. <laughs> Okay, so I think that is the end of the questions. So thank you guys for joining me. You were amazing. I totally enjoyed talking to you all. Thank you for joining us, Tanaz, and for giving us the insider's view of what it's like to be a writer. Up next, we have the award-winning Hamilton Youth Poets, who are here to show us the building blocks of another way to becoming a writer. 
producing your own slam poetry masterpiece. Exploring hip hop poetics and youth empowerment, Hamilton Youth Poets, or HYPE, was created in 2012 to give the city's youth the opportunity to develop their creative skills and have their voices heard. What's going on, y'all? It's your boy AK. You already know what it is. About to get y'all with these literary devices right quick. So real quick, what I'm gonna talk to y'all about is what an ode is. So an ode is a poem that takes everyday regular things and places them on a praiseworthy level, right? So taking things that, you know, a lot of times we go through the day and we take for granted that we don't really think about and identifying aspects of them that we really, really appreciate and we're grateful for and putting them on a level of praise or a level of, you know, gratefulness. Um, you can write an ode to anything. You can write an ode to your shoes, uh, an ode to your shoelaces, an ode to, an ode to your kneecaps. You can write an ode to anything. If I wanted to write an ode to my glasses, an ode to my glasses, I could talk about um, the fact that my glasses give me the ability to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see. They give me the ability to navigate with 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 clear vision and 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 having by having clear vision now I have a clear mind. You know what I mean? These are the type of things that we want to talk about when we're writing odes. It's just really really appreciating things that normally we wouldn't get to appreciate. Now, so. Um, yeah, so an old poem, again, taking something that's everyday, mundane, you usually don't get to talk about, and putting it on a praiseworthy level. Imagery uses words and phrases to create mental images for the reader. Imagery helps the reader to visualize. All right, let's talk about imagery. What is imagery? Imagery, it's using Expressive visual slash detailed language to describe an object, an action, idea, or an experience. Um, another way to put it is that imagery is like painting a picture in your head um, or painting a picture in your audience's head or connecting what we see with what we feel. Um, literary devices you have already gone over like metaphor, simile, personification fall under imagery. So when you're writing about imagery, or no, not when you're writing about imagery, but when you're using imagery in your poems, we want you guys to think about specific details of the char characters, experiences, um, places, or objects. So for example, some cool identifiers, or not cool, key, key identifiers is like a person's like outfit. Maybe they wear a very specific jean jacket, a specific hat, uh, maybe they have specific physical features like big eyes, bushy eyebrows, so on, so on. Colors are a great identifier. Um, you know, the green forest versus a dark gray forest. Two different vibes. Um, movement can help create visuals in our head. So Jacob Science talked about biking the block. You could talk about, you know, I was in a quick paced walk. I was running down the block. I was walking down the block. Three very different images. Um, emotions are a great way to kind of help you start that. So like, what does sadness look like in nature? What does sadness look like in your room? Uh, what's the image? Is it a messy room? Is it maybe actually a hyper clean room? Whatever that looks like for you. But basically what you're doing is you're writing with very specific details. Um, I hope that made sense. If not, we're going to look at imagery again in P. Ivan Young's poem. But I hope this helps. Alliteration. Alliteration is the occurrence of the same letter or sound at the beginning of adjacent or closely connected words, such as tall, trees, tipping. What's going on, y'all? It's your boy AK. I'm coming at you live from not the same room that you're in. Make sure you stay safe. Wash your hands. Wash your hands and don't touch your face. Stay safe out here. Um, so real quick, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about alliteration. So by definition, alliteration is the repetition of the same letter or consonant sound at the beginning of adjacent or closely connected words, right? So if I wanna break it down even further, alliteration is just the same letter or consonant sound at the start of words that are really close to each other, right? So a lot of times you hear people building blocks as an example of alliteration, right? Um, locked and loaded in this example of alliteration. Um, there's poems I've shared with y'all where y'all hear me do it, right? Scribble diligent rhythms, seeking synonyms, synonyms, synchronized systemic sentence. I'm setting a bar. That's a glass of alliteration. But we're going to look at it in Evolution of My Block by Jacob Sands. So in this poem, he uses alliteration a lot and it's used to sort of enhance it. This poem also almost reads more like a rap verse, more like a song than it would like a typical poem that doesn't rhyme. But 
The examples of alliteration in the beginning from the first line, as a boy, I bicycled the block. That's an example of alliteration, right? Um, with a brown mop top falling into a tail bleach blonde. That's another example of alliteration. If you scroll down a little bit further, um, as a teen, I could have beamed the crown, walked in and out with that beat down custom, wore with my cousin who claimed 2-6, right? So that's another example of alliteration. Um, so yeah, so alliteration pretty much is just there to enhance both the reader's experience. Uh, and it actually really, is really, really dope when the listener gets to hear some alliteration when they're listening to a poem. Um, so yeah, that's just a tool that y'all can use and work with. Okay. Now that you have a little more inspiration, this is your chance to become a slam poet master. Upload your performance or your composition to the Telling Tales contest page, and you might win a slam poetry swag bag. Up next, I am proud to say we have Josh Taylor, a strikingly handsome, amazing dancer and storyteller. He's quite the bee's knees if I do say so myself. <laughs> Let's pass it over to Josh. Hi Josh, thank you for having me. I'm here to give you some tips on how to tell a story through dance in under two minutes. Two minutes? That doesn't give us a lot of time. That's true. Then we should get started. Start the timer! Okay, first things first. We're gonna need a character. A character? Ah, it's gonna be a robot being booted up for the first time in a lab. That also takes care of our setting. Mm, dance tip. When doing the robot, you wanna be stiff and also be sure to move one or two body parts at a time. Ah, as well, be sure to come to a full stop before moving again. So, let's see, we're getting booted up, so we should start down, get up, and as our character is kind of learning, we want to examine what we've got going on and our surroundings. Let's try it, from the top. Wait, don't we need a theme or a plot? This is correct. Our theme is self-awareness. The plot is robot uprising. Robot uprising. Did we make the two minutes? Well, that was fun. Josh, may I say, that might have been the greatest thing I've ever witnessed in the history of media. <laughs> you have until November 30th to submit your entry to win the Slam Poetry Swag Bag on the Telling Tales contest page. Upload your zines to the Creativity Club and brag to your friends about how you are now a published writer. Thank you again for joining us, everyone. Telling Tales wants you to tell your story. You can do it. The right thing. See you soon. Thanks for joining us. And remember to visit our website for more events and to upload your artwork, your writing, your videos, and your ideas to the Telling Tales Creativity Club. Telling Tales is all about the joy of discovering how stories connect us. Tell us what you thought of this episode by filling out the survey on the Telling Tales website, and you could win a book from one of today's authors. See you again.